guys, welcome back for episode number 115 of the weekly playback. I apologize if this video seems darker than usual. It's because the ring light that is in front of me is not working. So it's broken and of course, you know, I didn't learn about it until today when I decided to shoot my video. So I'm going to need, about, need to buy a replacement for that ring light, but I do have two to the side. Um, I decided to still shoot a video just because I have a lot of games I need to get through and I didn't want them to pile up and have like a three hour video next week, <laughs> so which no one would watch. Um, so we are gonna do the best we can today with just two side lights and there is a window in front of me so hopefully it'll provide enough light so it's not super duper dark but yeah. So I played a couple of new games and then I played a couple of games which um, I've played before that I really enjoy so so we will start with the new ones. Uh, so let's just get started. So let's talk about Mistwind. Mistwind is a 2024 game for one to five players designed by Adrian Adam Skew and Daryl Andrews. Um, the art is done by Gordon Oscar and is published by First Fish Games. Uh, this is a game that I backed on Kickstarter, so it is not a review copy. Um, so I backed the deluxe version of this game, um, I believe. So like with all the deluxe components, I will say I do not like these um, uh, trays because the lid does not like stay secure so if you make the mistake of trying to pick up the whole thing with just the lid all the components just fall out because it'll like hold for like a second and then you think oh it's great and then boom it falls and everything falls out and it creates a huge mess that happened to me at least three or four times while I was unboxing it and then again yesterday when we were playing the game it's just very very frustrating that the lid does not like pop on. There's like just no secure thing on the side. So I find these uh, component holders really annoying to be honest. <laughs> so um, maybe I'll come up with my own solution but they do like all the things fit in nicely so I don't know what solution I could come up with that would maybe protect these. I just guess have, I just have to remember to hold it from the bottom when I take them out I guess. So this is a hidden bidding, hidden bidding uh, uh, action selection game in which each player is going to have some discs so I'll use purple since I'm wearing purple and I always play as purple so you're going to each person is going to have three transporters and again I back the deluxe version so I don't know if in the non deluxe version it's like this as well I honestly don't know uh, what the non deluxe version components are like and then you're going to have all of these um, uh, ports that you can build out why is it not focusing? Uh, there we go. And uh, each person will have some tokens which are unique to them in different shapes. Like for example, purples are leaves, but like for example, green had trees. And then each person is going to have these action selection discs. And in the deluxe version, very nice chunky discs, which are just really nice. They feel so nice. Just really, really love them. So um, I played a five player game of this, so I'm not sure in, uh, fewer than five player game how many rounds you have but in a five player game I believe we have five rounds um, so of course I'm going to throw up pictures um, and in a five player game you need to secretly at the beginning choose two discs that you are not going to use and place them face down onto the board apparently there is some ability that can come up uh, through some cards, some card play that would allow you to see which discs other players chose not to use in that round. Uh, because turn by turn, you're going to take uh, one of your discs and place it somewhere on the board, indicating uh, which action you want to take. And you're going to be placing it face up. So you're going to be doing your actions one by one, placing them face up. So you basically are going to be using the discs on the number indicated to indicate which action you want to take. So for example, there's going to be a main board and the main board is going to have a bunch of different ports uh, which you're trying to get to in order to pick up certain goods and then deliver certain goods and gain rewards and each transporter has a spot in which it can hold a good. So let me just uh, take out one of the goods uh, so I can show you how it holds it because um, it's pretty nice in the way that they, those uh, fit nicely. So for example here is I believe green was medicine. So you can like hold cubes in your transporters as you're trying to get from one port to another in order to deliver it and in order to get some victory points. So when you deliver goods in certain areas, you will get points for them. Um, so yes, so the board is going to have 
all the port locations with the different areas. And then off to the side, you're going to have um, off to one long side of the board, you're going to have these cards, which, uh, what are these cards called? These are port cards. So you'll have port cards and off to the side of the board, there's going to be numbers one through five. So one, two, three, four, five. So if you want to take the action of a port card, you will put your disc on the corresponding number. So if, for example, this card was located at the number two slot, you would need to have a, num a number two disc to place on the number two slot in order to use this card. And I'll talk about how these cards are used and what you're going to be doing with them. Similarly, uh, on the other side, on the other long side of the board, you're going to have character cards. And if you want to pick up a character card, you need to use the correct disc number. So for example, if this was located at slot number three, you would need to use disc number three in order to purchase this card. And you have to immediately be able to pay the cost of the card, even if it's an end game card or a card that you can use later in the game but you must be able to immediately in coins pay the cost of the character card so those are off to the long sides of the board and then on the top and the bottom of the short sides of the board you are going to have the resource board and the um what's the other board called there's a resource board and an action board, I guess. I don't remember what the names of the boards are, but here is the resource board. So for example, if you want to collect these resources when it's your turn and it's available because you can only have one disc per slot, you can use your five disc and put, put it here and then collect two iron, three wood, and one krill. Um, I, totally did not realize those were krill like from far away they look kind of look like bunny rabbits like with two ears sticking out but that's krill which makes more sense because your transporters are whales and then on the other side of the board the short end you're going to have this action board which if you place a disc you'll be able to take the corresponding action and I'll go over what the various actions are so that's where you're going to be placing your discs when it's your turn so you're going to go around and around from the first player taking turns to place your disc face up and then take the action. The disc must match the disc number of the location you're going to. So again, if you want to take this action, for example, you must place a number two disc and only one disc per location on these boards and on the character cards. The only location where you can have more than one disc, more than one person's discs, is for these port cards. And then there's going to be an action that you can take at the end of the round based on the top disc of the port cards, which we will get into. So uh, I will discuss all of that. So let me just show you your board where you keep track of resources. So you're going to be keeping track of your iron, your wood, your money, and your krill. You need to have krill in order to move around on the main board from port to port. Now, why would you want to move around? Because again, you're going to be trying to pick up goods and deliver goods in order to get points and you're also trying to fulfill your own personal objective card and create a network so a little bit of ticket to ride stuff going on here so at the beginning of the game each person is going to be dealt one medium one uh sorry one easy one medium and one difficult network card which is your own personal objective basically that you are trying to achieve so for example here is a medium one so it's going to show you on the board which ports need to be connected and when we say connected it does not mean that you're going to have like a line going from there to there to there those just show the ports and this shows like which ports you need connected so this one shows that it is this one this one shows that it's this one and this one shows that it's this one and you're going to need to use all the other ports by building out your towers or whatever those things are called placing your what are they called outposts. You need to build out your outposts and use your transporters so your transporters when they're at a certain location can count as part of that ne network. So using your transporters and outposts you're going to want to connect all three locations so that you can get the higher number of points. If you cannot connect all of those locations by the end of the game and reveal this during the game then if you have half of the network connected so either from here to here or from here to here then you can collect half the points at the end of the game. So again, you're going to be putting out outposts and you're going to be using your transporters to try to create these connections. The more difficult one, so for example this one, 
shows that you're going to need to have this connected to this to this. So again, if you complete the whole entire thing during the game, you can reveal this during the game and collect your eight points. Otherwise, if you have just half of it completed from one end to the middle, then you can collect four points at the end of the game. So you have to discard one of these objective cards, I believe, at some point during the game or at the beginning of the game. Um, I cannot remember exactly because we actually forgot to do that. So what we decided at the end of the game was that you can only score two of these since we completely forgot to discard a card. So on your turn, what you're first going to do, uh, and there are some of these, you know, these handy dandy player aids. So you must place an action disc that is mandatory. So again, you're going to place an action disc either on the action board, the resource board, uh, a character card or on a port card. So that's the first thing you're going to do. And then you'll do the action or whatever indicated, collect your resources, get your character card by paying for it, whatever. So you're going to do the thing for which you placed your action disc face up and then, you know, on everything except for the port cards, no one else could go to that spot. Then optionally, you can move a transport. So you can move from a port where you have no outposts or transports uh, and then move somewhere else, but that would require one crow. So if you do not have an outpost or another transporter there and you are trying to move to somewhere else, so from where you are moving, you want to have something of yours so that you do not need to pay krill because if you uh, move from somewhere and there's nothing left behind there's no outpost or transporter left behind then you need to pay a krill so throughout the game you are going to be trying to add more and more of your outposts so that tra uh transporting becomes cheaper and cheaper. And while you want to transport, move your transporters is again to pick up cargo and deliver cargo in order to get victory points. Because throughout the board, you are going to have these big locations that will have these higher numbered um, victory points for you to collect. And these will come out throughout the game. So for example, this one wants coffee. So if you can deliver coffee to the location where this is indicated, you will pick up this and collect two victory points. So there's going to be, oh, I just dropped one. There's going to be, different ones of these throughout the board for you to try to collect and then for each of the colors there's also smaller ones which will give you one victory point but along the edge of the smaller ones you will see that if you so for example this is where the smaller ones go so if you manage to deliver what was here you would pick up the victory point and in addition to that you could also collect two coins or one iron so you want to try to get to various locations in order to deliver um, and the big ones just give you the two points and then there's also going to be keys now there's keys that are placed on those big ports and those keys indicate what you need to have connecting from that location to another location in terms of flags so for example this one is going to be placed in the brown region and you will need to create a network from the purple flag to this location by using your outposts and your transporters in order to claim the top spot of the key, which would then give you six points in a four to five player game. So there are also going to be different uh, keys throughout the board for which you want to you know, try to achieve uh, by placing your outposts and transporters. Um, so again, after placing your action disc and doing the thing, then you can move a transport and you can move multiple transports as long as you can pay uh, for them for their movements by spending krill if required. So again, moving from a port where you do have an outpost or transport does not require you to pay krill. And then optionally, you can also load or unload cargo. So you may load cargo at ports that your transports visit. Uh, this may replace existing cargo. Uh, at krill ports, you may load one krill for each transport, adjusting player board accordingly. So having cargo loaded on your transport doesn't affect loading krill. So if you stop at a krill spot, you can load krill even if you have a piece of cargo on your transporter. You may unload cargo at territory capital port to gain a demand token of the matching cargo type, which are these tokens which I showed you about, which I showed you. Um, and then optionally, you can claim rewards. You can claim a network card, which again are those personal objectives. You can claim network tokens or achievements. So there are achievements which everyone will be trying to achieve. So there are going to be four different achievements on the board, A, B, C, and D. So for example, here is an A achievement. So this one means that you want to have an outpost built at each of the four different colored areas on the board. And I actually managed to achieve this. So once I built my fourth outpost in a different area, 
region of the board, I was able to collect this, which would be worth six points at the end of the game. So there are different kinds of achievement tokens. So there's going to be four of them placed on the board. So this one, you need to create a loop of five different outposts or transporters. And after you do that, you can create, uh, pick this up and get five points. So there's different four different achievement tokens on the board for you to achieve. And if you're the first one to do it, you pick it up and take it. So it's no longer there for everyone else to achieve. The keys, however, are available for other players to achieve, but you'll get lower points. So you want to be the first one to achieve those keys. Um, so that's basically it. So you're going around and around, taking turns, placing your action disc. So again, in a five player game, you're going to have three discs to place because two were discarded face down onto the board. And there may be a character card which may allow you to look at it. And that, you know, is important because as the game is progressing, you're going to need to decide which action is most important for you to take first. Because after you place one disc, then it's the next player's turn to place a disc. And then the next player's turn to take place a disc. And your spot might be taken like in the last round of the game I really really needed this action um, because I was trying to complete my personal objective for the large number of points I just needed to build in two locations and I had the money to build it so let's go over the actions on this board so this one will allow you to draw two character cards and keep one so if you placed a one disc here you that's an easier way to get a character card um, and I'm imagining you probably still need to pay for the card um, I, I did not use this one, so but I imagine you still need to pay for it because for the other things you uh, still need to pay for them. This one will allow you to build uh, a transporter for five coins or an outpost for three coins and you can do this up to twice in any combination. So this one will allow you to build uh, using uh, coins instead of resources and I'll explain how you build using resources in a minute. Uh, this one would allow you three free movement spots. Uh, three free movements without needing krill uh, so you can move your transporter up to three spaces this one will give you the first player token plus two krill and you can exchange resources so you can do an exchange of either a coin an iron or a wood and then this one would allow you to what is that oh yeah that one allows you to activate a port ability so on the port cards there are abilities at the bottom and so that would allow you to activate the ability of a port uh, and it looks like you need to pay one coin in order to do that as well so let me go over the port cards um, the resource board is pretty self-explanatory so i'm not going to go over that like so when you place a disc you'll just be collecting the resources on the area where you placed the discs and the lower number discs will also allow you to collect money and as i already showed you another way to get money is when you make a delivery at the smaller locations where the smaller one point um uh uh um, goods, discs are, um, uh, pieces, whatever you call those, tiles are, and you would be able to collect coins if you managed to deliver this one. And then they would just all slot down and a new one would come out showing you what you can deliver. So they all have something uh, on the back that shows you what you can deliver in order to take it. Um, so the port card. So if you place an action disc on a port card, you get to do the action that is indicated at the top. So this one allows you to build in that specific location on the board. So this would be the medicine green location on the main board. So you would find the medicine green location and spend the required resources so we are looking at this location right here, so the medicine green location, and you would pay the required resources in order to build here. So when you build, you can build either a transporter, and that's a way to bring out a new transporter because everyone starts the game with one transporter on the board. And if you want to bring out your other transporters, you need to pay for them. So how much does it cost to bring out a new transporter? So where is the player board? Here we go. So this shows you how much it costs. So in order to bring out a new transporter you need to pay two iron and two wood if you want to bring out an outpost you need to pay just one iron and one wood so these port cards allow you to build so by placing your disc on here you can build and then 
subsequently anyone else can place their disc on that same card. At the end of the round, the person whose, discs is, whose disc is on top of the pile will get to do the bottom action. So there's always going to be a bottom action which the person who's very on top can do. So that is the only location of the board where you can place more than one disc. I managed to get a character card that allowed me to move my disc from the bottom to the top at any point uh, during the game. So one time use. So that came in very handy for me because I really needed the action that was indicated on the bottom, but other people placed their discs on top of mine. So that was very useful. So in this game, you, you know, of course, uh, again, you're picking your discs and hiding them from everyone else when you're picking them. But before you pick your discs, the new cards come out. So at the end of a round, you're going to replenish the character cards with all new cards. Um, so if any were taken, if any were left over, you just get rid of the leftover ones and put out all new cards and all the port cards get removed and new port cards come out. So, you know, you will get a chance to look at the cards and then decide which three discs in a five player game you want to use in that round. Um, um, and again, someone might take your spot. So in the last round of the game, I really needed that number two spot on the action board in order to build out some uh, outposts, but someone else took it. And then I had to figure out what can I do? Okay, so now I have a number two disc that I can't use where I wanted to use it. So now I could use it either on a port or on the other side of the board and get a character card if that character card is not yet taken and it's good for me. So you are going to need to maybe improvise if someone takes your discs. So you probably want to choose discs that you know you would be happy using on multiple locations if it came down to that. So obviously the first disc you put down is going to be the most important thing that you want in that round. Um, and hopefully it will still be there because there's a chance, again, if you're you know farther down in turn order, you're not going to get to place that desk where you wanted to place it, which again is why there is a first player uh, thing on this board that you can take. So if you place your desk here, you will be able to get the first player marker for the next round. Um, I never did that, but you know, I was never unhappy with the turn order. Like I was never last in this game. No, actually I was, no, I was never last. So I was fine with the turn order, but that is essentially the game. And then end game scoring. So you're going to, at the end of the game, score whoever has the first player marker will get two points for having that cargo total. So for each uh, collected territory demand token, so which are the small ones, you get one point and then the bigger ones will give you two points. Um, cargo majority. So five victory points for the most delivered cargo per region. And there are four regions on the board. There's uh, purple, green, gray, and brown. Uh, one victory point tokens count as one for majority and two victory point tokens count as two for majority. So you're going to add up the value of your victory point tokens per region and whoever has the highest number will get five victory points for that region. And then if there's a tie, a uh, tied player split the points evenly rounding down. Um, achievements. So you're going to score victory points for all claimed achievements, which again were these. Um, so if you claimed any achievements, you would get those and all the achievements that you claimed on the board. So the keys, if you claimed those, you will get your victory points from those. Um, and then network cards. So you're going to score the larger victory points shown on the network cards if you reveal the card during the game or the smaller victory point if scored is scored if you completed only one of the connections at the end of the game. So again, half of the uh, card um, from one end to the middle. Um, and then character cards. If your character cards give you end game points, then you score those. And then whoever has the most points wins. And it says in case of a tie, the tied player with the most wood plus steel left over is the winner. If still tied, share the victory. So that is the game. So it is a hidden, uh, uh, disc selection, a hidden action selection game, disc placement uh, game in which you are taking a variety of actions and building out a network, delivering cargo. So it's also a pick up and deliver game. It's a network building game. It's an action selection game. And I really, really enjoyed it. Like I absolutely loved this game. I think it is so freaking good. And I am really looking forward to playing it again. Um, yeah, the only complaints I have, of course, are about the actual um, insert, like the containers. And I think that's a, you know, if that's my only complaint, then that's a, a good only complaint, I guess. <laughs> but really not happy with how these do not stay. Um, I cannot really think of any other complaints I have about this game. I really, really enjoyed it. And I played it at a five player count. So again, I don't know if at a lower player count, how many rounds you have. So in a five player game, we had five rounds, but there's only one side to the, oh, actually maybe it'll indicate right here. I'm just dropping everything. Um, 
it might actually indicate right on the board how many rounds you have. Uh, yeah, so in a up to a four player game, you have four rounds and in a five player game, you have five rounds. So if you're playing at two, three or four players, you will have four rounds. Oh, and then this indicates when you discard an objective card. So at the end of round two, we were supposed to discard one of our objective cards, which we forgot to do. So yeah, so that is the game. So if you like um, action selection games and kind of like planning out your actions, but also uh, realizing that you might not get to carry out the actions that you actually wanted to if you like network building and if you like pick up and deliver games I think you will absolutely love this game um, as much as I did so yeah so check out Mistwind if that seems like it's up your alley so let's move on so another game I played recently is Arx. I played a three-player game of this, and this is not a review copy. This is a copy that I purchased on my own, and it is just the base game. So Arx is a 2024 game for two to four players. Um, it, is, it is designed by Cole Worley. I don't know if that's how his last name is pronounced. The art is done by Kyle Farron, and it's published by Leader Games. Um, so this is a action points, um, area control majority influence kind of game area movement there's trick taking involved so yeah there's quite a bit of stuff going on in this game there's dice rolling there's combat so you know it can seem like it might be overwhelming but in terms of the various cold world games that i've played personally i would say that this was the easiest for me to learn um like pax pamir just kind of goes over my head completely i think i've played that two or three times and i believe i own it still unless i sold it i should probably sell it. Um, so yeah, I've played Pax Premier, the second edition, a couple of times. That goes over my head. Root I've played a number of times, which, you know, is enjoyable. Um, I had backed Oath on Kickstarter, which I immediately sold because once it arrived, I had decided I didn't want it. <laughs> so, so I immediately sold that and had no desire to play that. Um, so I think those are the only games of his that I have played or know about. Um, so yeah, but this, it was much easier to learn, in my opinion, than a game like Pax Premier, um, which I only got because of the theme and the location and, you know, my connection to that region of the world. So in this game, um, you are each going to have your own board on which, um, you know, I'll have to throw out pictures, but you're going to have like various um, things that you're going to be trying to build. You're going to be storing um, resources like goods that you pick up. Um, on your board. You're going to be storing trophies and captives and I'll explain what trophies and captives are. Um, so it comes with this handy dandy player aid because you're going to need it. <laughs> so this game is played over chapters. I'm not going to go into super much detail, super much, a lot of detail about this because um, there's countless videos about this if you want to learn how to play it and I know I'm not going to do it justice in trying to explain it. So I'll just give you like an overview of this game rather than a detailed how to play because I know I can't do this game justice. Um, but basically you are going to be dealt some cards and in a three player game uh, you're not going to be dealt all of the cards. Uh, so the cards numbered one and seven I believe were removed. So this is where the trick taking aspect comes in. So again, the cards numbered one and seven will be removed in a three player game. And then you're left with cards numbered two through five, six. So, and the cards are of different types. So here's a card. So this is an aggression card. Here's a mobilization card. And these allow you to do different kinds of actions. Um, here is a construction card. And finally, we have administration. So those are the four different suits in this game. And then the value of the card and then the pips, you know, will determine whether you win a trick that you've played or how many and how many actions you can take. So the lead player will play a card and then you can surpass them by playing a card of the same suit with a higher number, which would allow you to take the first player token for the next round, which can be really important. And the reason you would want the first player token is because you might want to declare, um, what is it called? Where's that token? So you might want to declare an ambition. So declaring an ambition, you would place this if you are the lead player on the card. And what that means is now something is going to get scored at the end of the round. Um, so when someone declares an ambition, you will take one of the victory point tokens that is available, and these will be end up getting flipped over throughout the game, and they will be worth more and more. So you're going to take the first one that's still available at the top section of the board and place it onto 
the ambition that the person has declared and what is declared is on the card. So you're going to look at the card and you can only declare the icon that is on the bottom of the card that you played if you are the lead player. So on the main board, I guess I should take out the main board to show you. Um, there are several areas indicated on the side. Um, and that will tell you what you can declare as an ambition. So on the side over here, you have Tycoon. I know, oh, this is terrible. I can't really show you. Let me, let me move it this way. <laughs> so you have Tycoon, you have, um, oh my God, oh, this is terrible. Okay, Tycoon, Tyrant, Warlord, Keeper, and Empath. And those are like different areas of the board. So I know I just put it away right now, but the pictures uh, you'll see a round area of the board and certain areas in a three-player game will be blocked off so you cannot build there you can't travel there but different areas when you start building out on different areas you are able to collect resources and how you collect resources is by you know taking the action of a certain card so for example um, administration will allow you to collect resources which is the tax action um, so these different cards allow you different actions but when you declare an ambition if you're the first player you're indicating that you want a certain type of token icon to be scored at the end of the round and whoever has the most of that icon from all the cards and the resources in their uh, possession at the end of the game will win that number of victory points um, so by being first player it's the only way you can declare ambition so that's why you might want to win a trick and surpass if you can so when you're playing a card you can either surpass which means play an action card matching the lead card suit but with a higher number than it and then you can take one action per pip on your played card so again the higher number of the cards the lower the amount of pips um, but so that's how many actions you can take and you'll be taking the actions as indicated on the card so for example aggression allows you to battle or move or secure securing means uh taking a card that you kind of um placed influence on so there's different kinds of cards in this game um there are these I don't know what they're called, uh, guild cards. So there are these guild cards which you can place influence on, your little peoples, and by placing influence on them, you can try to claim them. So those are ships. So for example, you can place a person on it and then try to secure that card. If there are other people's people on that card, then you will claim those people as your prisoners, as your captives, which can be very helpful if you are resolving for um, one of the things, uh, I believe it's uh, Keeper or Tyrant or some one of those will count. Whoever has the most number of captives would win that ambition if that ambition had been declared. Um, so yeah, so you can, uh, you know, so one of the actions available again on that card is to secure, which means you can take one of these cards if you have the most people on it. Um, so different cards give you different kinds of actions. So let's just go over the cards. So construction allows you to build or repair. And again, the number of pips determines how many times you can do that. And of course, for building, you need resources in order to build or not resources. You have to have like a certain uh, you have to have one of your ships or something already present in a region and you have to have space available to build. So if the region is already uh, filled with um, like for example, stations or uh, what are they called? So if this region is already filled with um, cities or starports, then and there's no spaces for those, then you obviously cannot build, which is why you might want to battle in order to remove someone's city or starport. Um, so aggression allows you to battle, move, or secure, which we I think we already went over. Administration allows you to tax, repair, or influence. Um, construction, build, or repair. Oh, monetization allows you to move or influence. So you can move a ship from one region to another, and there are specific rules about moving as well. I think that's all of the cards, right? We did mobilization, aggression, construction, and uh, administration, tax repair or influence. So administration is how you get those um, tokens. So if you, for every region in which you have um, a city, you will get to take the resource of that city and place it on your board if you have space available on your board. Um, and where you place things on your board, so as you start to build out your cities and starports, which are going to be these triangles that you'll have filled in at the beginning of the game, which will open up more space for 
resources for you to collect when you tax, uh, you can determine where you want to place something when you collect it and you can move items around. And you will probably want to place your more valuable things under the locations that have uh, the higher number of keys because keys uh, you know are something so when someone decides to battle you and if they win they can try to steal some of your resources so they would need a certain number of keys in order to steal certain things so keep your most prized possessions in the locations that have three keys but of course uh, you only start with one three location and key location and the other one would only open up if you've already built whatever was on this triangle. So um, you need to start from left to right in terms of building. Um, so yeah, so uh, the game is played over a certain number of rounds, a certain number of chapters, unless someone gets to, I believe, 30 points. So in a three player game, if someone reaches 30 points, then they would win and you would not continue with the game. Like, you know, you would finish off the round and then see who has the most number of points, uh, 33 points, no, 30 points in a three player game and then finish. So in a four player game, it's 27 points and in a two player game, it's 33 points. So you're going to continue playing until either you finish all the chapters, which are rounds, or someone hits the designated number of points. And then you uh, will go to uh, just, you know, count up all your points and then whoever has the most points will win. Um, so that's really the gist of the game, the gist of the game. So again, um, Ending a chapter, I guess I can go over that quickly. So you'll score ambitions. So if anyone declared ambitions throughout the chapter, you would score them. So here are the different ambitions you can declare. Tycoon, have the most fuel and material icons from resources and guild cards. So fuel, again, you need to be in a certain region in order to pick up fuel. So you must have had a city or you must have been able to steal this or have this icon on guild cards that you were able to secure. So that is fuel. So the different regions of the board allow you to tax for different resources again. Tyrant, have the most captive. So again, if you secured um, a card and other people's um, people were on that, uh, agents were on that card, you would have taken their agents as captives. So if you have the most captives on your board, if a tyrant is ambition is resolved, then you would get the points for that. Warlord, have the most trophies. So if you battled throughout the chapter and you managed to secure another person's ships or their cities or their star ports, those all count as one point uh, towards having a trophy. So whoever has the most trophies would uh, win that ambition if that was being scored. Keeper, have the most relic icons from resources and guild cards. Relic icons are these icons specifically. So if you have these, the most of those, you would win that ambition. And then finally, empath, have the most psionic icons from resources and guild cards, which again is this one. And uh, again, in order to get those, you can tax or secure guild cards that have those icons on them or steal them from other players. So you want to get first player token so that you can declare uh, ambitions and secure points and win the game that way. Um, I posted about this game on Twitter when I was playing it, like when I was in the middle of a game, and someone responded saying that he played a game in which no one declared a single ambition. That makes no sense to me. I cannot understand why you would do that to yourself. That seems like torture to me, like playing a super long game of this in which no one declares any ambitions and then the game just ends because you finish the chapter. So I, I don't even know how you score points in that way. Like if you never declare any ambitions, then how do you score points? Maybe they have uh, guild cards with end game points on them. So I guess maybe you would score points from those. Um, so yeah, I guess we can go to end game. Um, so end game, you're going to, again, end the game if someone reaches the requisite number of points or you finish all the chapters. If the game ends, the player with the most power is the winner. On a tie, the tied player earliest in turn order is the winner. If the game does not end, advance the chapter marker once. Um, then draw cards. Wait, so if the game... So what happens once you reach the end of a chapter and no one declared any ambitions? Um, I wonder if there's any guild cards that give you end game points because now I don't even know how you would score points if you, if you never declared any ambitions. Are there any cards which give you end of game points? I don't know. Okay, uh, I really have no clue how anyone would score points if you've never declared an ambition. I don't know. 
But apparently someone played a game like that and I don't understand well, how or why that could be enjoyable. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. And uh, yeah, so I think that's basically the game. The game does come with other cards, like character cards and advanced stuff that you can play with. Um, we played just a basic game of this since it was, um, I played a three player game for me and one other player. It was our first time playing this game. And for the person who taught us, it was like his eighth or ninth time playing this game. So of course he kicked our butts. Um, so it was an enjoyable game. I enjoy like area control games. I enjoy battle when it's not the whole idea of the game. So in this game, battle is not like the main component. Like you can battle, but it's not like the overall thing because there's lots of different things going on like you can try to gain points in other ways so for that reason i really enjoyed this game and it's going to stay in my collection for now and i can foresee myself playing this again um yeah so if that sounds like something you're interested in if you like trick taking um i would recommend this if you have a hard time understanding how trick taking games work probably not the game for you and i understand trick taking is not everyone's cup of tea so but trick taking is really what's going to drive what you get to do how many actions you get to take and so on. So you really need to be into the whole trick-taking aspect in order to enjoy this game, I think. Um, otherwise, great components. I, of course, upgraded my um, addition with little boxes, containers to store all the components. I did not like the insert, so I got rid of the cardboard insert. But yeah, so that is the game. I do not plan on getting the expansion because, you know, I've got a billion games and I don't think I'll ever get around to playing with the expansion. So yeah, so that is our, so if that sounds like something you're interested in, then you should check it out. So let's move on. So another game I played recently is Camp Pine Top. So I played a five player game with this. This is a 2020 game for one to five players designed by Steve, Stephen Davies. And the art is done by Stephen Davies and Jason Washburn and it's published by Talon Strike Studios. This is a review copy that I received many years ago, I think back in 2020 or 2021. Um, I absolutely love this game. It is like one of my favorite games to play in the summertime. Unfortunately, I had not played it in a long long time so i don't even know when the last time is that i played this game and whether i've ever discussed it in my weekly playback so i am going to talk about how it plays just in case i've never talked about it before um so this is a really fun game it brings a lot of summer vibes even though i never got to go to camp as a kid which is really sad um, my mom was just a very overprotective muslim mother who wasn't sure what would happen in camps and so i never got to go to any sleepovers or sleepaway camps or anything like that <laughs> so tmi i know okay so each person is going to have a troop board. So in a multiplayer game, you're going to be using this. If you're playing solo, then there are different, it looks like different solo boards for you to choose from, or maybe you play with all of them. I really don't know how the solo side works because I've never played a solo, but in a multiplayer game, you are going to have a troop board and you are going to start out as a possum. And I love possums. I think they are so cute and they are extremely important to the environment. So possums do eat ticks. So, you know, some people think they're ugly. I think they're adorable and they keep ticks away so if you see a possum in your yard definitely keep it possums are friends not foes so everyone starts as a possum with a hand limit of eight cards and then in order to advance to skunk and skunks are super adorable and i'll talk about some skunks later in the cat section of the video but skunks are awesome so if you play if you want to advance to skunk you need to have either completed two of these achievements two of these achievements or two of these achievements and then your hand limit will become seven and then to advance to um, uh, woodchuck or whatever that is, beaver, you need to have completed either this number of achievements, this number of achievements of that type, this number of achievements, and you must have advanced one of your achievements to the advanced side. And I'll go over what all of that means. But basically, you're trying to fulfill the requirements in one of the columns plus the advanced numbers. So, you, you know, you always have to do the number of arrows as indicated. So advance that number of patches before you can move your marker up to the next thing. And whoever reaches the badger first will win the game. So it's kind of a race. So you are racing to become a badger. Um, so depending on the number of players, you're going to have a layout of different location cards. Um, and the cards are so cool. I absolutely love the artwork on them. And there's different types of cards. So there are blue tents, green tents, and gray tents. And they offer you different things. So for example, blue tents is where you can fulfill the square achievements. Uh, green ones are where you can achieve the circle achievement patches and I'll go over what the achievement patches are and stuff and then the other ones the gray ones is where you can achieve the triangle patches 
And so those are the different kinds of locations that you will have and you are trying to achieve achievement patches. So let me just show you some achievement patches so I can explain how those work. So each person starts with one trooper on the board. So let me just show you a troop person or animal rather. So here they all look the same, but they are different colors. So here's a purple one. So you're going to start with one troop member on the board and you can have up to four. And I'll explain how you bring out new ones. So here are some achievement patches. So on your board, you will see that there are achievement patches which you need to achieve in order to advance to the next level. So for example, for me to advance to skunk, I uh, got two blue square achievement patches. And these give you special abilities when you achieve them. So for example, this one is really great. So resourcefulness. So it says you may select from both sides of the supply card offer when drawing. So I'll go over the actions so you can understand a little bit more about how it plays. So when you are playing, when you're all set up, each person is going to have one person on the board and you are going to have a certain number of resource cards in your hand. So I'll show you some of the resource cards. So here are examples of resource cards and you'll see like different kinds of icons on them and colors and so on and different kinds of tents on some of them. So not everyone has a tent, but some of them do. So those are resource cards and you're going to start the game with a certain number in hand, uh, depending on which player you are in turn order. And on your turn, you are going to take one of the following four actions. So the four actions available are to either draw two cards from the supply card area. So the draw deck is in the center and then on each side of the draw deck, there are two face up cards. So when you are drawing cards, you can either take from one side of the draw deck or a combination of the draw deck and one side of the deck, unless there is a rainbow card. So unless there is a wild card, these are wild cards. So if you are starting the game and there is a wild card, if you pick up a wild card, that is the only card you can pick up then. Unless you happen to draw blindly from the draw deck and you happen to get like one or two, then great. Um, but if there's any face up, you can only pick up one if there's a wild card. Otherwise, you can draw up to two cards, uh, a combination of the draw deck and one side or the other. You cannot pick a card from each side and then those get replenished immediately. So that is one action you can do. Uh, you can draw one supply card and move one camper to a new map location. And you definitely want to be moving around because that's how you're going to start collecting achievement patches and we'll explain, I'll explain how you do that. Um, you can, so that's another action you can do. Take one supply card and move one camper to a new map location. Another action you can do is to move a camper to a new map location and collect an achievement patch. So in order to get an achievement patch, you are going to be moving from one location to another. So for an, as an example, let me explain. So let's suppose you were on Orion's Traverse and you were going into the Embers Forest. Ember Forest. So you are here and you want to end up here. You would jump from here to here. You can only move orthogonally one space unless you've un unlocked an achievement which will let you move up to two spaces or move diagonally. I don't know if there is an achievement that lets you move diagonally. But let's suppose you go from here to here. Now you are going to collect this achievement patch, if that's the action you took, by paying this number in this amount and cards. So you need two yellow icons and one green icon in order to collect this achievement patch since that's the patch you decided you wanted and you're coming from this direction so that's the only patch you can take on this tile unless you have a special ability that lets you choose some other patch. But you're always going to take the patch that you crossed over and landed on in that area and paid that in resources. So then you will need to, you know, cough up those colors and put them in the discard in order to then place that achievement patch onto your board and indicate that you now have that achievement patch. And again, different achievement patches give you different abilities. And if you advance an achievement patch, meaning you collected that achievement patch again, again, you would need to land in a certain area with that achievement patch and pay the same amount of cards as indicated on that card on that tile. And then you can advance your achievement patch to the advanced side where you see an arrow. And then you will have even a better ability than was on the regular side of that achievement patch. So you can advance your achievement patches and in order to increase 
and get to the bottom, you will need to advance achievement patches. So in order to become a beaver, you need to have at least one advanced achievement patch. In order to become a raccoon, you need two advanced achievement patches. And in order to become a badger and win the game, you need three plus all the requirements in one of the columns. So that is essentially the game. You're just going around the board with your camper in order to unlock achievement patches, add them to your board and advance in troop so that you can become a badger first and hopefully win the game. It's a super fun light easy game to play. I really enjoy this game a lot and there are abilities throughout the game which will allow you to mess with other people. You'll be able to move cards around in the area. You'll be able to like do different things. It's, it's a really fun game. I think it is a really great game to play in the summertime just because of the whole camping theme. I just really enjoy it. It's just a very cute light fun game. Um, so yeah so this is a game that will just stay in my collection forever because I love it. Um, it does come with, um, I don't know if it comes with it maybe you need to buy them separately but there are like an expansion and advanced game variants that you can play of this game which I have never done but maybe someday hopefully. So yeah so that is Camp Pine Top. So again whoever becomes Badger first wins and yeah so if that sounds like something you're interested in then you should check it out. I think it's super adorable and super fun. So yeah so let's move on. So I'll just go very quickly through some other games I recently played. I played another game of Yonder, a three player game, which is right there and is still on Kickstarter. If you are interested in backing, I'll have a link below. Uh, you can click on if you want to go back it. So I played a three player game of this um, and my third play of this game and yet again, I lost. I have yet to win a game. So I think that means I'm a really good teacher because every time I play, I play with people who've never played this game before and someone else always wins. <laughs> but in every game I've like gone after a different strategy and that's what I love about Hakan Garter games. They're like super easy to learn, but like you can always explore different strategies and always try to get like a different engine going and just try to win in a different kind of way. This time I only lost by two points. So very close. Um, it was a really good game. Um, so yeah, so I highly recommend Yonder if you are into worker placement games with variable workers and you like the whole fantasy theme and you love that clean crisp art look because you, you know that's what Hakan is known for. I absolutely love his art, his art style. It is very unique. It's very him. So yeah, so definitely check out Yonder if that sounds like something you're interested in. Again, link below. So that's on Kickstarter. And again, this is a review copy and I was sponsored to do an overview video, overview video of that game. Um, another game I played again recently is Cities, which I uh, is from De Beer Games, which I received a review copy of. So I think this was my third play of Cities. So I talked about it before. I'll leave a link below into my in-depth discussion of how to play Cities, but really love this game. So again, you know, if you enjoy games in which you are placing tiles and building up your city, um, yeah, and just trying to fulfill different objectives, I highly recommend it. It's a very quick, uh, not very quick, but it's a quick city building game that is a lot of fun with a lot of variability because you know different city boards have different objectives that you're trying to meet and so on. So I played a three player game of that again recently so that was my third play of it. And then another game I played again recently is Brian Burrow. Now I have not played Brian Burrow for years. When I played it years ago back in 2021 I believe it was I scored 38 points so obviously I knew what I was doing because I came in second place in that game. I think the winner had like 41 points um, but yesterday when I played it. I played a five player game of it. Number one, we did play wrong. So I wrongly wrong. Um, so I learned afterwards that um, we were short a round. So we should have had one more round. We played three rounds. We should have had four. So maybe I could have done better than having 10 points. Like I basically ended up where I started because you start the game with 10 points and everyone else had more. Um, so yeah, so I did not do well. I did not perform well in yesterday's game. So that is a trick taking area control game. So if you again, you enjoy trick taking and you enjoy area control. Um, it's a game you might want to check out. It is a game I enjoy, though yesterday I was kind of struggling. Uh, you know, I had an all day game day and this was the last game we played. And by then I was kind of a little bit brain dead and just really tired. Um, so yeah, so those are the other games I played recently. So let's move on to games that I am backing or have received. So let's start with the easier section first, which is uh, games I'm backing. So I'm backing both Yonder and Luthier at the $1 pledge levels in order to get my production copies of the games, since I covered both of them for their Kickstarter and it's always a part of my contract to get a production copy of the game, uh, which is why I charge less than some other content creators for my preview videos, which are overview videos. Um, so yeah, so those are the only two active campaigns I have. Uh, the other games I was backing, which I talked about last week, they all ended, which was 
Kinza and Piri Piri. So I ended up keeping my pledges for those. Um, but recently I just got a credit card bill and I'm like, holy shit. Like, <laughs> yeah, I really need to cut back on buying and uh, back in games because that was a lot. And, you know, you it's so easy to spend money, especially when you have a credit card. And then when the bill comes, you're like, yeah, maybe, maybe I should be more careful. Um, so yeah, so I will try to be more careful going forward. Um, so those are the only two games I'm backing. So let me go into games that I have either received or purchased. So I'll start first with games that I purchased. So I purchased this game from my game store and it is Harvest. So it is a fantastically fun fur filled farming affair. So when this was on Kickstarter, I wasn't sure if I should back it. Like I was really like into it. I looked super duper adorable. And then I was like, okay, it'll be in retail. And I know that Millennium Games will have the all-in edition and maybe I can get it cheaper. Um, so I bought it and I bought the like uh, all-in except for the playmats. I did not buy the playmats, but I bought the extra animeeples. So I bought the deluxe golden edition and then I bought the an extra animeeples. Um, but I did not purchase the playmats. So I have everything except for the playmats. And then when I looked at how much I spent and how much I would have spent on the Kickstarter, it was about the same. In, th in fact, I think I paid $5 more. So it's not true that you will always save money if you wait until it's in retail. Um, so I guess if you back things on Kickstarter and, and even with shipping included, sometimes the cost is less because they are rewarding you for, uh, backing the game and helping it to come to life. So I guess that's something to keep in mind. So if I see in the future that there's a game that I think I'll end up buying in retail, but they're offering a discount for people who are backing it on Kickstarter, um, you know, I suppose I, I should consider just backing it then. Um, and, you know, because here I was wrong in thinking that I would actually save money. In fact, I ended up spending a little bit more money than, uh, you know, otherwise. So it comes with really nice inserts. So again, I have the golden edition and the inserts hold both the cardboard components and the deluxe components, which is nice. So I'll show you some of the deluxe components. I think these are pumpkins. I'm not 100% sure. So those are actually, I can do a comparison. So that's the deluxe edition. And here is the regular and then we have these, which I don't know what that is, maybe wheat. I'm guessing it's wheat. So again, deluxe compared to the regular edition. And then we have strawberries. So let me get out a strawberry. Where are you strawberries? I actually really like the cardboard edition of the strawberry because it's on a pink background, which I absolutely love. I actually think I wore a shirt in a video not too long ago with strawberries on a pink, uh, and the shirt was pink and there were strawberries on it. So yeah, uh, we have blueberries. In terms of berries, um, blueberries might be my least favorite of the berries. I prefer raspberries and strawberries and blackberries. I think blueberries are my least favorite. Uh, these, I don't think that there's a, a deluxe uh, component for, but there are these tiles and it looks like blueberries go on top of them and I don't see a deluxe version of it. Um, so yeah, so there are those, uh, that's that. Uh, the coins, so here is the deluxe version of the coins. So there are metal coins. I really love the coins. They've got mushrooms on them. Yeah, so that's a three cent coin. And then the one, or one cent coin has acorns on them. So yeah. So again, really awesome how, you know, they give inserts for everything. And then there are these like other components. Um, I don't know, this looks like it's supposed to be poop. <laughs> um, so there was, I don't know where I put the non-deluxe editions of those, but they're not here. Um, this looks like a water droplet. And there is a tractor. I guess this is the first player marker, maybe. And then there is like these like buckets and stuff like that. Um, so, and then in the non-deluxe edition, you have these carts or these barrels, which are your player markers. However, in the deluxe edition, um, you get these cool animals, which I'm gonna now show you. So let me just show you the box because everything fits really nicely in the box. So both of these trays just fit really nicely on top and there is no lid lift. Uh, the rule book is really nice and there's even a solo challenge almanac. Um, and then let me show you the board. 
So I just really love the art style. It's just very country pretty art. Just, yeah, colorful. Really, really love it. It really reminds me of the countryside. Absolutely love it. Um, and then there's these animal player cards. Which I did not sleeve because these are the only cards in the game. So I was like, I guess I won't sleeve them. But I guess I'll show you the side that has the special actions for each character. So you need to use Gary the cow if you're playing solo, I think. Now these cards, I believe, came with the golden edition, but the animals depicted on them, you needed to purchase some of them separately. So if you got the golden edition, unless you purchased the additional animal meeples, you would not have all of the meeples that match these animals, I think, um, if I remember correctly, because I'm pretty sure this came with the golden edition. Um, so here is an individual player board and they are dual layered, which is really nice. And then here is the insert. Um, so some of the pieces fell out of their spots, but you get an idea of what it looks like. Um, so each, so if you uh, do not purchase all the additional animeeples, you will have additional spaces available because they have slots for every single animeeple, including all the special extra ones. So here is a little dude and there's four of each so you can use three for your um, player markers and then one for a scoring marker uh, is what I read online. And again I'm not sure which ones came with the golden edition because I, if I remember correctly three or four of them came with the golden edition and the rest come in the box that you had to purchase separately if you wanted to. Um, so I cannot remember which ones came now with the golden edition. But yeah, I mean, this is it was just really hard for me to resist. I love animals. I just love cutesy games. Um, I'm a huge animal lover. So just could not resist. You know what would have been really awesome if they had a possum? Oh, I wish they had a possum. But they have a badger, which I love. I love badgers. I wish we had badgers that looked like that in America. And this is the last one. And then it comes uh, with buttons, like these wooden buttons, which I guess you can also use for the score marker if you want to, instead of an animal meeple. Um, there are these tiles and some smaller tiles of the same shape. Oh, oops, um, the tractor was supposed to go here. There's actually a space for the tractor. I did not see that. I guess I will move it to here. Okay. Um, and then there are these tiles. I won't show you all of them, but they're different location tiles. Again, really love the artwork. So this is just half of the tiles. No, a quarter of the tiles. There's a lot more, sorry. There are a lot more. So yeah, so that is all the components for um, this game. And I'm super duper excited to play it. So uh, my friend said we can play it at game night on Friday. So really looking forward to that. I really cannot wait to play this. Um, yeah, very excited. So I know it was super duper expensive and seeing my credit card bill recently just really scared me. So I know I need to start selling games, which I am going to start doing. I really need to start calling my collection. So that was a purchase. Another purchase was this. So I got the new edition of Ex Libris. I already have the old edition of this, which I purchased many years ago, um, but I wanted the new edition. It's rated more, uh, it's rated better than the old edition. Um, so I don't know what exactly is revised. So I'm going to um, maybe take out the old edition, compare the artwork and then stuff. This was on sale. So I got this on sale um, at Barnes and Noble. Like they, it was in their sales section and Barnes and Noble is a bookstore in America and they often have these like really good sales when you know uh, things are not selling so they mark them down really cheap so it comes with this dry erase scoreboard I believe this is a scoreboard um, and then a bu bunch of different location tiles so this is a worker placement game and you are building up a library so these are just some of the location tiles from what I can remember, the art style is different. I think it's a different art style. And I can re from what I can remember, the meeples and stuff are very different. Like I do not remember the meeples looking like this. So I'll have to find my old edition and compare the meeples and stuff. But like here is a witch. She's cool looking. I do love witches. Um, and then the rest all look like gnomes of different colors. So just different colors for the different player colors and stuff like that. So. 
So yeah, and then it comes with a gelatinous cube, which was just a cube. Um, and then a bunch of different library cards. So the thing I really love about this game is all the books have such funny, cool names on them. And you're trying to like collect different icons and stuff. And you're trying to place books in your shelf in a certain way. Um, so like, for example, Hellscaping. Uh, I can't read it because the lighting is not so good. Evil Lawns and Gardens. Oh, well, that's cool. Haunted Furniture and Upholstery. So yeah, the books just have really fun, cool titles, which I really love reading when I play this game. So maybe I'll take this to game night on Friday and see if my friend is interested in playing this too. I'm not going to sleeve the card because there's way too many cards and sleeving is expensive. So I need to really stop, you know, sleeving every game I have. It's just, it's just not economically feasible. So this is another game I purchased. Now I will show you some, oh, the other games that arrived in the last week, of course, I already showed you Mistwind. So that was a new arrival in the last week. And then I will show you some review copies. So I finally got my production copy of Fairies and Magical Creatures. So this was a game I covered for its Kickstarter starter and I received the Kickstarter edition of it. Um, so I would really like to play this again at some point. Um, so it comes with these player boards and it plays up to five players I believe. Um, and then there is a main board. Uh, the insert is not great. You have to store the tiles all outside of the bag otherwise they will not fit in the insert. So the insert I had to store all of the tiles outside of the bag in one component. But you have these different tiles which you can place as a sidewalk if I remember correctly or as a garden. And then um, this edition comes with these miniatures for the different characters, which is really cool. Um, so I'll show you all of them. So um, this company, Forbidden Games, which also published Raccoon Tycoon, was bought by, I believe, a company called University Games. And there's some kind of lawsuit pending right now. If you Google it, you can find information about it. So I almost was not even sent this, but then I got an email about it from, you know, someone like, because I had backed it at $1 at the pledge manager level, so I decided to just reach out to them myself to see if I could still get my production copy of it. Um, and I did, which is nice, um, though much later than anticipated. But, but still, it doesn't matter because I have a billion games, so. Um, yeah, and there's a bunch of different tiles like these. I really wanted my production copy of this game because I ab absolutely love this artist. Anne Ste Steig, I believe is her name. I just really, really love her artwork. This is really nice, like holy crap, this is huge and really nice. Um, and then there's just a bunch of different crystals and stuff like that and the different player colors. And then the cards, I will show you the cards because they are amazing. And again, was tempted to uh, sleeve, but sleeving is expensive. So I was like, you know what, that's fine. I won't sleeve them. And so you can appreciate the art even more because I'm not sleeving them. But yeah, just such gorgeous artwork. So like, you know, I just really needed this game because I absolutely love her artwork in this game, just so stunning. And it was a fun game from what I remember. I just really need to play it again because the only time I played it was when I was producing content for my overview video. But yes, just stunning, stunning artwork. Absolutely love it. So looking forward to playing this again at some point in time. So that finally arrived, which I'm super duper happy about. And then I will show you another review copy that I received. Oh, actually, I don't think I'm allowed to unbox it yet. Uh, there is an embargo on it, I think. But I can just show you the box. <laughs> so I received Planta Nubo. So yes, so this arrived uh, from Devere Games. Um, and I think there's an embargo, so I won't show you the contents. Um, let me just check what the date was in case I'm within the date. Maybe then I can show you. Planta Nubu. Okay, let me see. Bum, ba -da -bum, bum, bum. Okay, yes, I am embargoed from posting any content. So maybe I shouldn't have even showed you. Okay, so, but you know, pretend you didn't see that. Okay, so, so yes, uh, I will not show you anything from that yet because uh, there is an embargo. So those are the games that arrived recently. I know that I'm due to receive my uh, copy of Nestlings tomorrow, which is a review copy I'm getting. So the publisher was kind enough to credit my Kickstarter account so that I could get a copy of that game, uh, a review copy of it, which is very awesome. So that's arriving tomorrow. So lots of games, 
waiting to be played and I really need to start getting to the ones that I haven't played yet. So let's move on to a section which I haven't done in a very long time, which is games I am calling because things are out of control here. Like I have yet again, I'm living in a house now and yet again, I find games piled on the floor because I've run out of space. Like that should not be happening. <laughs> like I live in a four bedroom house by myself. I have a library with shelves, you know, dedicated to holding games and then this game room and there's shelves back there. There's shelving within that closet. Like this should not be happening. And I have a calyx over there. So yet again, I am at a point where I'm like, what is going on? So uh, I was talking to a friend and she said that a good policy would be for every game that comes in, two should go out. And I agree. I think that that starts, needs to start happening. So two need to go out. So I already picked one game, which I'm planning on calling, which I decided a long time ago, I would call is Mary Posas by Elizabeth Hargrave. Played that game once. I just did not enjoy it like I thought I would. I love butterflies and I thought, oh, it's a game about butterflies and migration, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I thought I would enjoy it. I recall not really enjoying that. Um, and I do even have the special purple butterfly for it. So I think I'm going to call that. And then I need to decide what else I'm calling. But you know, you'll start seeing more and more games uh, come in this section and I'll start bringing them out and showing them to you and talking about why I am calling them. Um, just because I really need to start calling games. I'm actually eyeing a game in front of me right now, which I showed you guys a few weeks ago, which I purchased using my store credit at Millennium, which is Alpaca from Pegasus Spiel. And as I was paying for my Harvest game, oh my God, did I regret buying Alpaca. I'm like, why did I spend $20 on this game? Like, what is so special about this game that I needed it? Just because it has alpacas in it and it doesn't even have a good rating on BGG? Like, and then, yeah, I'm just, I, we need to be careful about spending money and just not throwing money away. Like even though it was store credit, that's money that I spent to go to a game night. Because when you go to a game night at Millennium Games, you pay $10 to enter and you get that back as store credit. So it was my money. I mean, yes, I enjoyed my time playing games there, but like I, yeah, I should not have bought Alpaca. I haven't even played it yet. The artwork does not appeal to me. Based on the cover, I thought I would like the artwork, but then when I opened up the cards and I was like, oh yeah, don't like this. So yeah, that was a mistake. So need to be much more careful going forward. So let's move on to the update section. So I guess the first thing in the update section is Gen Con. So I guess Gen Con is coming up. Uh, like next weekend, I think. And of course I'm not going. Um, it's insanely expensive, so I'm not going to go. Um, but I thought I would mention two games that I know that are being released at Gen Con that I'm excited for, which are Gnome Hollow and Boop the Halls. I'm still on the uh, list serve for media for the op. So I keep on getting these emails, you know, saying, oh, if you want to request a review copy, fill out this form. And I always fill out the form, but I never get anything um, because I'm guessing the marketing manager is probably someone who doesn't like me in that case, because I have yet to receive a single review copy from the op and I've filled out multiple forms. <laughs> so I think it's a game I'm going to need to purchase if I want it. Um, so Gnome Hollow is a game I'm very much interested in. Like the hype around this game is like really, like there's a lot of hype around this game. Like apparently people think it's really amazing. So many people have talked about how amazing and wonderful it is. So very curious to try out Gnome Hollow. And then the other game I would really like is Boop the Halls, which is being released at Gen Con. But the, you know, um, that's a game that I'm sure will be available in retail later. So it is the Christmas edition of Boop and I have the Halloween edition, which is Boop. Um, so I don't have the basic regular edition of this game, which I don't even care about. I really like Halloween, so I definitely want, you know, wanted the Halloween edition. If I can get the Christmas one, great. It's, uh, it looks like the cats are on gift boxes and it looks like you're going to be jumping up various levels. So that looks a little bit different. Um, I'll just again, you know, another plug for a FlagCon. If you're interested in coming to FlagCon, I think I got the dates wrong. I think I mentioned in a previous video that it was the first weekend of November. It's actually the second weekend of November. So I got the dates wrong, but do check out FlagCon and do come if you are available because it'll be in, you know, in a convention center, a really nice convention center in downtown Ithaca this year. Just, it'll, it'll be really amazing. And Ithaca in autumn is just really amazing. Um, Essen is coming up. I cannot believe how soon Essen will be here, Spiel Essen. Like, 
just two months away basically like we just need to get through august and september and then it'll be time for spiel like that's insane so i need to book my tickets for that soon i need to book my plane tickets so yeah so that's coming up so i need to make a video about all the games which i'm excited for at spiel but like I said, I really need to be careful about spending money and I just don't want to struggle like I did last year with, you know, bringing back a whole bunch of games, which was really hard. Um, so I need to figure out what I'm going to do and just really prioritize what I think will be really difficult to get in America at some point or whatever. Oh, and I forgot that I actually backed a game which I had marked as feel a sin pickup so there is that and i also uh did it for a friend so a friend also backed the game and i'm picking it up for him as well so that's already two games that i'm picking up so yeah space is going to be limited so i completely forgot about that i'm going to have to make have to make a note of that so that i don't forget to pick up my copies of that game um, which is cat packs by the way um so yeah so i will do a video at some point um soon about all the games um us and the new releases and which ones i'm excited about uh let's go into cats um so the first cat update is that girly is still missing and i am really just heartbroken like at this point i don't know if she's ever gonna come back it's been like four weeks i think minimum four weeks minimum a month i don't know what happened to her but god do i miss her like i didn't realize how much like how attached I would get to these cats and like it's almost like I've lost a cat of my own like when I go there there's like this horrible feeling in the pit of my stomach just like this like emptiness that I feel like she's gone she's not here she used to run up to me she used to like start eating from the plate like it's just really really awful like that is definitely going to be a downside of being a cat feeder because like anytime a cat dies or goes missing or whatever it's just going to be extremely devastating and I've already gone through that with my own cats I went through that with my childhood cat who went missing who was both an indoor outdoor cat and oh my god I cried for months and months when he went missing his name was Kitty he was a tuxedo cat it was just really really devastating um and then of course I was extremely devastated when Dobby died who I consider to be my soul cat who was also a tuxedo cat and when he died it was just so hard like it was just like losing my best friend it was losing a piece of me and um he's buried in my backyard and uh between um two hibiscus trees actually so right now the hibiscus trees are in full bloom and it's just nice to see uh some petals falling on top of his grave but you know it's just it's just so hard i just uh, i get really attached to animals i just love animals more than i love people so it's really really hard and i'm just really sad that girly is gone and I, it's just awful um but yeah but she's gone um i think she's gone like i i don't expect to see her again which is really sad um i'm actually on this app called next door which uh, people are always posting about animals they found or animals that are missing and every single post that comes up about a cat i check just to see if it's her but no it's not um, but there are skunks. There's a whole family of skunks living at colony number two and I've accidentally surprised them a couple of times now. Like they, I guess, like to eat around the same time that I feed them. Um, so I've, you know, come up to the feeding area and the baby skunks get so startled. And it's so funny because when the baby skunks get startled, they like look at you and they start backing away from you backwards. Like they'll like look at me and like start moving backwards. They are so freaking adorable. So I'll post a video or a picture of some skunks here but they're just so cute i haven't been sprayed i actually don't know if baby skunks have spraying power but i hope if i do see the mother that she realizes that i'm the one who's feeding them like all the food they're eating is from me so i hope that i won't get sprayed um because that would really suck <laughs> so but they're so adorable they are just so freaking cute i love them uh and there is a whole family like there are way more raccoons than i thought uh, before at colony number one because one day I stumbled upon the whole family of them the mother and all the babies and I think there were at least five babies that I stumbled upon and unfortunately I didn't have my camera ready so they all ran away um, but they were so cute um, so yeah so I think you know like I discussed in my last video um, I think befriending the raccoons is not gonna happen considering that they just all ran away from me <laughs> so so yeah so the, my plan of relocating the whole family of raccoons to my backyard probably is not going to become a reality but you never know you never know um so let's move on to book clubs 
So I am excited to report that we have someone who joined the Fiction Book Club, Sandra. So welcome, Sandra. So maybe it's just you and me. So maybe I'm just talking to you. <laughs> but yay. So if you caught up, you were supposed to read chapter three. So we have read all the way to the end of chapter three. So I really like chapter three. I think it's really interesting how she takes like actual concepts that we know of and incorporates them into this dream store. Like the idea of selling precognitive dreams, like dreams that might give you a little glimpse of the future. Um, so it's an interesting concept because, you know, some people do believe that dreams can tell you what might happen. You know, there's all these people who try to interpret dreams, like people who try to say, oh, this dream means that, this dream means that. Like the other day, a friend of mine was here and he said he had a bad dream and he told me what the dream was. I won't mention it. And I won't mention it because my mom told me many years ago that this dream, if you have it, means that someone very close to you is going to die. And her evidence for this as well is the fact that my father had this dream and shortly after his best friend died uh, from leukemia. And so ever since I was little, I've been told that that dream means someone very close to you is going to die. So then when my friend reported he had that dream, he's like, oh, well, it's possible because he mentioned that a lot of people close to him have died, which is really, really sad and sucky. Um, but he said it's possible. So I guess we'll find out. So if he reports a death to me sometime soon, then maybe that's proof. Not really but you know, could be coincidence but you know people have all kinds of meanings attributed to different dreams and this chapter was all about precognitive dreams which is very interesting and then she goes into how these leftover precognitive dreams which I think uh, if I'm understanding correctly like I was a little bit confused what she meant by leftovers like it seemed like they are just like little tiny snippets instead of like because the dreams that are being sold to dollar gut dream department store are the leftovers like the actual precognitive dreams are being sold to other department stores that sell dreams but dollar gut is getting the leftovers so i'm wondering if the leftovers are just tiny little snippets whereas at the other dream stores you can get like a bigger picture of what the future is but this one is just giving you snippets which in the chapter you find out is deja vu so basically whenever someone buys one of these little snippet precognitive dreams from Dollar Gut, it's actually that deja vu feeling you get. And I like how she tied in the characters from the previous chapter, that girl and guy who started dating at the end of that chapter, and she ties it in into this chapter with a new character who's friends with the girl who used to dream about her now current boyfriend, who was her crush at that time. So I like that tie in. So I'm wondering as the story progresses, if we're going to see new characters and they're all going to be interconnected somehow. Um, so I guess my question of the week is, would you want precognitive dreams? Would you want to actually be able to tell the future from a dream? Like th the problem here is that we don't actually know what dreams really mean. I mean, do we? I guess we kind of do like there are certain dreams that are basically called stress dreams like people are like okay if you have that dream it means you are facing a lot of stress like I will say that one of the dreams I have which is really weird it's, you know and I have it a lot at times when I'm really I guess stressed out or worried about something or something like that is a dream where I'm at the top of a staircase and I'm just terrified like absolutely terrified to walk down the stairs like debilitatingly terrified like i just cannot take the first step like going down the staircase is just the most terrifying thing in this dream yeah so that's a dream that i have like when i'm really like stressed out or whatever so you know people do attribute meanings to different types of dreams and it's like how did we come to agree that that is what that dream means like i don't know but apparently there's some kind of science behind it right i don't know um but one quote that I just marked, which I thought was interesting and I just want to read was, let me find it. Um, so it's when they're discussing whether or not you would want to be able to know the future. And the girl who is in the stream store says, um, so the guy who's trying to sell her the dream dollar got himself, he says, you don't want to know if you'll be a successful screenwriter because she's trying to become a screenwriter. And she says, not at all. I would actually be unhappy to know it in advance. Um, even if my future seems bright, it's not guaranteed that the dream will come true and it'll only, it'll only make me idle. And if it doesn't come true, I would be devastated. And how true is that? Like if I had a dream which people told me meant I will be very successful and then it doesn't happen or that I will be happily married someday and then it doesn't happen or that I will meet the love of my life and it doesn't happen, I would be really sad. I would be devastated. Um, 
if it doesn't happen. And on the other point she makes is it would also make you idle. Like maybe you're not even going to work towards those things anymore because maybe the things that you would have done to make that bright future possible, you're not doing it anymore because you think you don't need to do it anymore because a dream told you that you're just going to be successful. Um, so many years ago, like many, many, many years ago, my mother told me that she went to like some fortune teller kind of guy, like in Islam, you know, some people believe that there are certain people who have a closer connection to God and they're able to tell you things about your life that maybe, uh, you know, a regular person would not be able to know, but because they have some closer connection to God, they can do that. So I was told, my mom was told many, many years ago that out of all of her three daughters, I was the luckiest. And when my mom told me this, like it stuck with me for the rest of my life. Like to this day, I remember it. And to this day, I always wonder what makes me luckier than my sisters. Because when I look at my sisters, <laughs> I look at my older sister, who is a very successful doctor who lives, you know, I love my house by the way, but she lives in a really big house. She makes a shit ton of money. You know, she gets to do whatever she wants. Like money is no worry for her whatsoever, right? Again, all relative. Uh, my younger sister is currently finishing, uh, she's in residency. She just started her residency. She finished medical school, you know, but like what makes me a luckier person than them? My older sister is happily married right now. I am not, I am single and have the shittiest luck when it comes to dating and my love life. So again, like what makes me luckier than them? But this is something that my mother told me many years ago and it stuck with me and at this point, I'm like, I don't know if that's true. But because it stuck with me all my life, I was convinced that I'm going to have this bright future with a really amazing husband someday. And yeah, it convinced me of that. And it's not that I've stopped working towards that. Like I'm still on dating apps and still go through all these disastrous states. But I don't know. But I think that quote is true. Like if you were told you're going to have a bright future, it might make you stop working towards that. It might also make you really devastated if it doesn't happen like at what point am i going to be the lucky one like at what point in my life will i know oh yeah that guy who told my mom i was the luckiest of us three oh yeah he's totally right because x y and z happened like it's just ridiculous so i'm not sure i believe stuff like this um but you know people have attributed meanings to dreams so my question for whoever is in the book club whether it's just sandra or other people as well if you could have dreams that would give you a snippet of the future would you want that um, I guess not. I mean, it's a kind of exciting to think that you can kind of get a glimpse of something that might happen. But again, I don't know, you know, what if you find out something bad? Like what if it shows you something bad? I don't want to know something bad. Um, so I think I'm going to have to go with a hard no. I think I don't want to know what the future is. I think part of life and what makes life so wonderful is not knowing the future. Like right now I'm single and I, you know, hope someday I'll meet someone who is like, you know, my best friend and who, with whom I can have a wonderful life. Like for me, one of the most important things in a partner is being able to have intellectually stimulating conversations. Like I just lose interest in the person if they cannot have those conversations with me. Like I am a very curious person. I'm always wanting to learn about everything. So if I can't have intellectually stimulating conversations with my partner, um, I think that, you know, they wouldn't be my partner. Like I would not be attracted to them. Like I'm, I'm mostly attracted to people who can talk at length about all kinds of different things. Like I just am a very curious person and just love learning. Um, where was I going with this? Um, yeah. Oh yeah. I was saying that it's kind of exciting not knowing the future, like knowing that, okay, maybe someday I'll meet someone and it'll work out and I'll be happy, but you know, maybe not, maybe it won't happen, but I like not knowing. I like knowing that there is a possibility of something. So not knowing makes that possible. Like it makes it possible to have a possibility. <laughs> so if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, so I don't think I would want to know the future for my dream. So you let me know whether you would. And since this book is quite short and the chapters are quite short and the print is quite big, let's read two chapters because I think we can get through this much quicker. So for next week, read chapters four and five. Uh, so yeah, so for next week, read chapters four and five. So let's move on. So for the nonfiction book club, we are reading The Hundred Years War in Palestine, which is absolutely relevant to today and what is going on and the genocide. And we, for this week, we're supposed to read the second half of chapter one, which is quite long. So that means we were supposed to read up to the end of page 54. So the second half of chapter one talked about the uprisings. Um, so it talked about the League of Nations. 
and the mandate issued for Palestine and everything that that mandate meant for the Palestinians. Like, this was so infuriating. Someone commented um, that the Balfour Declaration, Declaration was just the tip of the iceberg, and it's so true, and you already start to see that in this chapter. Like, oh my god, it was just so infuriating like how people came in who had the British who had no connection to the land whatsoever and decided that they can do whatever they want with it. They can give it away to whoever they want. They can make rules, you know, because it's their right. Like this is colonization. Like everything you read in this chapter is colonization. Uh, so again, I'll just read some parts which stuck out to me. So, I mean, I highlighted a lot. So, you know, it goes through all the articles of the mandate um, for Palestine. So I guess I won't go through all of the, you know, each point, but like some things that stuck out, like, you know, it described only the Jewish people as having a historic connection to Palestine. Completely ignored the Arabs who have been living there for thousands of years. Like, okay, yeah, they have no connection to the land. Like, okay, complete bullshit. Um, what else? Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. you know again the mandate it did nothing but give the jewish people all this power it gave them like all these civil powers and powers to do things while the palestinians were left completely powerless and were treated and to this day are still treated like second class citizens just very very infuriating um one part was um it says here uh let's see so article 7 provided for a nationality law to facilitate the acquisition of palestinian citizenship by jews blah 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 and then it says thus jewish immigrants irrespective of their origins could acquire palestinian nationality while native palestinian arabs who happened to be abroad when the british took over were denied it so if you happen to be abroad as a palestinian you were no longer allowed to have palestinian nationality but if you were just coming into palestine and you were jewish boom you're a palestinian like or in this case today israeli like Oh, so infuriating. Not fair. Just not right. Um, and then I talked about, um, uh, you know, some letters that were written and some documentation and all of it shows that all the ill intent behind this, the intent from the very beginning to make Palestinians second class citizens in their own home. Like all these writings between these important people back then show you that their intent was always to treat Palestinians as second class citizens. <sighs> it's just very, very frustrating. Um, let's see what else. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like one of the things was that they did little to advance education for the Palestinians, obviously, right? Because uh, that's what you do in a colonial government when you are in a colonial state. When you take over someone else's land and you decide it's yours, you aren't going to want the people there to be educated. Like you don't want them to be able to write and talk about, you know, their rights. You don't want them to educate themselves and make them realize like, yeah, this is wrong. We can stand up and we can do something about it. So he even mentions like, so for example, they censored the newspapers, they banned political activity. Uh, they da, 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 yeah, and they did little to advance education. Uh, and it says, since colonial conventional wisdom held that too much of it produced natives who did not know their proper place. Again, colonialism. This is colonialism. Um, so yeah, what else? I think I starred something else. So let me just find it if I can find it. You know, just very very infuriating. Oh yeah, here's something. Um, so, you know, this chapter starts talking about the uprisings that are happening, how the Palestinians are getting together, and these, like, militant groups are starting to form. Why are they starting to form? Because, of course, they are going to fight against a colonial power who's coming in, giving away their land. Like, it was so infuriating to read that land belonging to you know, farmers and stuff like that was just being sold to Jewish people as though it didn't belong to anyone. You have Palestinians who have been living on this land for many, many years and their land, their home is just being sold to newcomers as though it didn't belong to them. Like that is just wrong. It's just plain wrong. Um, 
So uh, here's a quote. It says, to quash this uprising, the British Empire brought in two additional d divisions of troops, squadrons of bombers, and all the paraphernalia of repression that it had perfected over many decades of colonial wars. Like this chapter also talked about the Irish and how, you know, the Irish were being colonized and how they hated Balfour because of what he did to Ireland and stuff like that. And that's why the Irish are great supporters of Palestine. Like if you look at people in Ireland, they are pro-Palestinian and rightly so because they went through this. They have gone through what the Palestinians are still going through. Um, so here's an important thing. So it said, the British resorted to tying Palestinian prisoners to the front of armored cars and locomotives to prevent rebel attack, a tactic they had pioneered in a futile effort to crush resistance of the Irish during their War of Independence from 1919 to 1921. Guess what? We are seeing this right now. There are armored vehicles of the Israeli occupation forces and they have tied Palestinian captives to those vehicles to prevent attacks by rebels, or in this case, Hamas. Like, like you are seeing that today. Like, Israel is an occupying entity. It is an occupier. Like, it gained this land. It gained, you know, everything by occupation, by colonial occupation. And as we've seen, it is the right, it is the inter international right of a a uh, nation of a people who have been occupied to resist that occupation. Like it has been declared by international bodies that any people who are occupied have the right of resistance. They have the right to militarily, to violently resist occupation. Because at that point, you run out of any other means. Like there are no other means for these people to resist. You think the Palestinians today sitting down and having a conversation with like someone evil like Netanyahu is going to work? No, it's not going to work. Like having just basic conversations is not going to get anyone anywhere, the Palestinians anywhere. Like there is no negotiation to be had. Like since the beginning, since October, we've seen like, oh, they keep on claiming, the Zionists keep on claiming, oh, just return the hostages and the genocide will end. No, time and time again, deals have been offered to Israel, which have been rejected, to return all of the prisoners in exchange for Palestinian prisoners, people who have been held prisoner in Israel in torture, like they are being like actually mentally and physically tortured, which has been documented, well documented. And you have kids, you have children who have been captured, you have all these innocent people who have li literally done nothing wrong, who are being held in Israel prisons and being tortured. And Palestinians have repeatedly said, return this many prisoners to us, we will return all the hostages and we will, you know, end this. But no, like time and time again, Netanyahu has declined and declined and declined. So when you hear on these, you know, news outlets like, oh yeah, Hamas declined another, you know, ceasefire deal. No, it's Israel that has repeatedly declined and declined and declined. Uh, Israel has no intention of getting the hostages back because it doesn't care about them. It has had one intention since the beginning, which is to take over Gaza. And we have seen that time and time again. They are already selling land in Gaza to settlers. They are already advertising that land for sale in the United States to Jewish people to go and settle that land. Like, ah, oh, it's so infuriating. So again, this chapter talks about so much stuff that we are seeing already. It's just, it's just right now, I mean, not already. I mean, it's been happening since, you know, 1917 or whatever. It's just so infuriating. Oh, I'm just, yeah, I'm just so angry. Um, hmm. Yeah, the chapter talked a lot about like sending, you know, the people who were vocal uh, and exiling them to the Seychelles, to various parts of the world so that they couldn't educate the rest of the Palestinian masses about what was happening to them. It's really infuriating because you see that they knew what they were doing since the beginning, the intent since the beginning. In the chapter, there were some quotes that I had highlighted, which now I'm sure I passed over, but the intent was very clear and they knew from the beginning that you know, the Zionist nation would completely take over. Palestinians were given no rights. And they knew from the beginning that the Palestinians would revolt, that this would result in violence because it does anywhere where there's a colonial power taking over. There is going to be violence when you want to fight back. Um, so then there is this. Um, so it says, um, 
After 1917, the Palestinians found themselves in a triple bind, which may have been unique in the history of resistance to colonial settler movements. Unlike most other peoples who fell under colonial rule, they not only had to contend with the colonial power in the metropole, in, the, in this case London, but also with a singular colonial settler movement that, while beholden to Britain, was independent of it, had its own national mission, Zionism, a seductive biblical justification, and an established international base in financing. That is exactly what you see today. Zionism is a colonial movement, and it has its own financing. And who is financing it today? Like, the United States is one of the biggest fin financiers of Zionism. Like, and what do the Palestinians have? Nothing. Um, it's just very frustrating that like the League of Nations and the Britain, uh, the British can come in and decide what to do with a piece of land that does not fucking belong to them. Like that is colonialism. Like how can anyone read this history, be aware of this history and say that it is anything but colonialism? And you know what people use as just justification for saying it's not colonialism? Well, there was a war fought in this year and so and so and the Palestinians lost. So fair game, they lost. Like, no, if there is ever a war on the land of Palestine, it is an uprising. It is the colonized people fighting against colonialism. This is not a war between nations. This is a war between a colonized people trying to regain what has been lost. This is not a war between nations. So when people use these wars as justification that the Palestinians lost and it's not theirs, fucking bullshit. This is not a war. No, this is a colonial power who repressed an uprising, essentially. All these wars are uprisings. They are not wars. Wars are when you have nations with their own militaries fighting each other. That is not the case in, in Palestine. That is not the case in Palestine. Uh, so yeah, so that was this chapter. Just so infuriating. Just really, really, it just boils my blood that you have clear evidence that this is colonialism and you have people today saying that it is not colonialism. Like bullshit. It is colonialism and you can see it. Um, so for next week, we are going to read the first half of chapter two. Chapter two is the second declaration of war, 1947 to 1948. So this is a very long chapter yet again. So the first half is going to be very long and this is very dense reading as we've already discussed. So read up to the break on page 75 which is about half of chapter two. So read up to this break. Um, so that is what we will read for next week. And now I will talk about Palestine and the board game industry because there are updates. So let's go into that. So if you guys follow Twitter, you might have seen this news. I'm not sure it was posted anywhere else. I can't imagine it being posted on Board Game Geek, which I would say is pro-Zionist, like even if they claim to be for Palestinian rights. We've already established in previous videos that this industry is pro-Zionist. Like even if it claims it cares about Palestinian lives, it still will not speak up against Zionist creators in this industry. So I don't know if you'll see this news in Board Game Geek, but Board Game Wire reported it. So Spiel des Jahres, which is like the most prestigious board game award in the world, bans Daybreak co-designer Matteo Menapace for wearing a pro-Palestine watermelon sticker at the 2024 awards. So Matteo Menapace very bravely wore a t-shirt with a Palestine sticker on it. The Palestine sticker is a sticker of the state of Palestine, or as people like to call it, Israel today, in a watermelon shape. So it's a watermelon in the shape of Palestine, and he got banned for wearing that. And why did he get banned for wearing it? Because, you know, uh, Germany claims that, you know, saying from the river to the sea is a genocidal slogan. Like, forget the fact that there's an actual genocide being committed on the Palestinians right now, and not on the Israelis, People have convinced themselves and have tried to convince the world that saying from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free is a genocidal slogan. It is not a genocidal slogan. The Palestinian people have not indicated any intent 
to exterminate the people who currently reside in Israel, the Jewish people. They have made no intent to exterminate the Jewish people. They just want their land back. They just want their homes back. They just want the land back from which they were kicked out. And to this day, you see settlers going in and kicking people out of their homes. Like there is countless video footage of this. There is countless video footage of Israelis like literally going into people's homes and saying, this is my home now. And the Palestinians are crying and you have the IOF, the Israeli Occupation Forces, standing behind the settlers saying, yep, get the fuck out or we're going to shoot you. Like, what choice do they have at that point in time? Like, obviously, their lives are more valuable than a house, but, you know, it's just it's devastating. Like, you see settlers going in into the West Bank and now Gaza and just taking over everywhere. Like, this has been happening. So when we, when Palestinians say from the river to the sea, and just to be clear, I'm not Palestinian, but when Palestinians say from the river to the sea, they are not indicating an intent to kill the people. They are indicating that they want their homes back, that they want equal rights, that they want to be treated as the citizens that they were a Palestine until they were kicked out and colonized. Um, so he wore the sticker, which Germany very stupidly and wrongly said is genocidal, and it is not of genocidal intent. And this is a very clear case of, you know, people projecting, like it's where the accuser is actually guilty of the accusation they are making. Like every accusation when it comes to Israelis is a confession. Everything that they have ever accused the Palestinians of, they themselves are guilty of. They accused the Palestinians of burning babies alive on October 7th. Time and time again, that has been proven to be false. There were no babies burned alive in ovens on October 7th. There were no beheaded babies. It has been proven to be false time and time again. But Israeli Zionists are fucking liars. All they ever do is lie, 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 lie. That is all they ever do is lie and steal. That is their entire existence. So every single fucking accusation is a confession. So when they say that the Palestinians have genocidal intent, look at who is actually fucking committing a genocide right now? It is the Israelis. They are the ones committing a genocide, yet they're so scared that the Palestinians are going to commit a genocide. Every accusation is a confession. So that is one important thing to keep in mind. Every accusation is a confession. There was reports of rape happened that happened on October 7th. Again, proven to be false. Time and time again, every single thing that they claimed happened on October 7th has been proven to be false. It has been proven to be false. Yet there are reports that show that Palestinian women are, and men are raped in Israeli prisons, not just by humans, but by dogs. They have trained dogs to rape humans. Like it is absolutely disgusting. It is sick. Like these people are fucking sick. Zionists are fucking sick in the head. So, uh, so every accusation is a confession. So stupid Spiel de Jars banned him for life for wearing the sticker to show his support for the people who are in the middle of a fucking genocide. And he issued a statement about this and I definitely need to go and buy his game because he is a supporter of Palestine. So I'm definitely going to go and buy this game Daybreak to show my support for this designer. Uh, let me see if I can find his statement and read it for you guys. Um, and then I'll just, you know, say a little bit more about uh, what I want to say about all this news and how, it, you know, the board game industry in general. Uh, so here is a statement. Um, one second, I'm just pulling it up now. Do -do 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 -do. Okay, let me see if I can find his statement. No, that's the story that he was banned. Sorry. Let me just look him up on Twitter. I know he has a Twitter account where he posted his statement. Mateo Menapace. Okay, I found him. We're almost there, guys. We're almost there. Okay, sorry. I know I should have these things prepared. Okay, so here is his statement, which he uh, posted on Medium. So he wrote, my decision to wear a watermelon sticker, oh shit, I got that stupid subscriber thing pop up. My decision to wear a watermelon sticker on the Spiel de Jar stage on Sunday was to show solidarity with Palestinian civilians. The watermelon is a symbol of Palestinian resilience in the face of decades of oppression. Yes, decades of oppression, which we can see from this book and countless other history sources. I bought the sticker from Wear the Peace, which I highly recommend you support. 
an organization that donates 100% of their profits to humanitarian aid. I acknowledge the current and historical context that has led to SDG uh, Spiel des Jahres as a German institution to respond with heightened sensitivity to allegations of anti-Semitism. I take those allegations very seriously. However, debating the shape of the sticker and pushing for an anti-Semitic interpretation is a distraction. Yes, 100% a fucking distraction. We see this time and time again where people are trying to distract you from what is fucking happening. A genocide. Continuing, instead, I want to draw attention to the reality of thousands of Palestinian people, hundreds of thousands, millions, in fact, that's me going back to his statement. I want to draw attention to the reality of thousands of Palestinian people who are being wiped off the map and are in dire need of humanitarian and medical services. No human being or group of people should be erased because of their ethnicity, religion, or nationality. I hope we can all agree on that. All humans deserve peace and justice. I believe this won't be possible until the end of what the International Court of Justice has recently defined as unlawful occupation. What we can do as citizens of Western nations is to put pressure on our governments to take responsibility for their historical role in this injustice and end our complicity with their funding and enabling of war crimes. These actions and views are entirely my own and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else involved with daybreak slash emission. End of statement. Amazing. Like, this is what we need more of in the board gaming community. We need more people who are willing to stand up and say that this is a fucking genocide. Uh, so just, I just want to comment on a few things he made. Yes, it's a distraction to say that this is anti-Semitic. It is a distraction when people say that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. It is not the fucking same. Explain to me why there are hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jews who are anti-Zionist and will openly tell you that Zionism is against Judaism. It has no connection to Judaism. But people are painting it as Judaism because they want you to think that it's anti-Semitic to be anti-Zionist. It is not anti-Semitic to be anti-Zionist. Uh, it is, in fact, you know, upholding the values of Judaism as told by, again, hundreds of thousands of Jews who are anti-Zionist. They will tell you that Zionism goes against their values and it goes against what they themselves suffered in the Holocaust. And here you see Germany overcompensating for what happened in World War II. Like this is fucking overcompensation. Like their support for Zionism and for a for a nation that is currently committing a genocide against a group of people is fucking overcompensation for what happened in World War II. Like, he should not have been banned for wearing that sticker. It is not an anti-Semitic sticker. It is not an, a genocidal statement of any kind. Again, every accusation is a confession from what we have seen since October 7th. Every fucking accusation is a confession from Israelis and Zionists. So yes, so what do we see in this industry? We see people, you know, rightly retweeting this and saying that Spiel des Jahres is wrong. They are in the wrong. But what I have personally also seen is no one, st still no one fucking calling out Zionist creators in this industry. So in this industry, you know, one of you know, the people who brought light to this news was someone who, you know, back in 2021, when I spoke up against Burnt Island Games for being anti-Palestinian and pro-Zionist, labeled me as dangerous, you know? So time and time again, this is what we see. People who in 2021, and to this day, still supporting their Zionist publishers and friends and designers in the industry, will not speak up against the bad actors. Like, these are the same people who say that you have to have difficult conversations and you need to call out your friends if they are in the wrong. Apparently that doesn't apply to Zionists. Apparently, you know, Zionists get a free pass in this industry. Apparently you can be a fucking bad actor and be perfectly fine in the industry and have no one say shit to you about anything. And Zionists are fucking bad actors. So while I appreciate the attention that people are bringing to this very bad decision by Spiel des Jahres, I still do not appreciate the fact that these people are fucking hypocrites. Like the people in this industry who will not speak up against Zionism, who will continue to support their Zionist publishers and designers and creator friends who are fucking Zionist shills. Like I would love to know why Watch It Played even retweeted the new about him being this uh, designer being banned from Spiel des Jahres when he has yet to make a statement that you know calls for a ceasefire that 
rightly so condemns Zionism. Like condemning Zionism would be a noble thing, but these people just will not do it because that would you know, result in them losing business. Like they don't want to fucking lose business. And what are you if you are someone who will not stand up for your supposed ideals because you are gaining money from it? That is the definition of a sellout in a shill. Like that is the fucking definition of a sellout in a shill. Like again, our family plays games. No one wants to call out our family plays games for accepting blood money from a Zionist publisher. Like we have seen Starbucks lose profits around the world. Like the CEO of Starbucks is concerned about Starbucks because of how many profits they have lost. And why are they losing profits? Because pro-Palestinian people are boycotting Starbucks for its Zionist connection. Anyone who has any connection to being a Zionist is boycotted by people like me. Like we are boycotting Zionists because we don't want a single penny of ours to be going and towards the genocide towards the extermination of an entire people and um burnt island games and kids table board gaming is owned by zionists it's owned by fucking zionists and we still see the industry giving them a fucking pass like you see people on twitter who have you know participated in the fundraiser for palestinian children actively participating in promoting games from Burn Island Games and Kids Table Board Game. Like they are still actively promoting these games. Like fucking make that make sense. It does not make any fucking sense. It is no different than someone saying they support black lives and then on the flip side, accepting money from Nazis. It's the same fucking thing or white supremacists. It's basically the same thing. Like if Our Family Plays Games is all about Black Lives Matter, they should still go and find a white supremacist sponsor because that is essentially the same fucking thing. Because you are taking money from a Zionist creator while claiming to care about Palestinian lives. So anyone in this industry in the future when you know they make Black Lives Matter a huge thing again in this industry and want to condemn people who won't plaster Black Lives Matter on their social media or on their company pages, if they start to make a big fucking deal about that again, people should not be afraid. They should just basically say, hey, if you can accept Zionist money while claiming Palestinian lives matter, then why should I, you know, not be allowed to accept money from these white supremacist publishers? Why should I not be promoting their games? Like, no fucking difference. Like, this industry has huge double standards when it comes to Muslims and Arabs, and you can see it all the fucking time. Like, no one's taking a stand against Zionism and the bad Zionist actors in this industry. No one is taking a stand against Quackalope for being a Zionist. He openly referred into in his videos, you know, the video, I am a Jew, he's openly posted links to really bad people, really bad Zionists, and no one care, gives a shit. They care more about his cringy thumbnails and stuff like that. Uh, just to further prove that there are double standards in this industry, another person in the industry who, uh, you know, uh, went, you know, said a lot of shit about me back in 2021, he made a tweet not so long ago where he referred to the Palestinians as fucking Palestinians. Now, try putting fuggin' before any other group that is marginalized and that this industry cares about. Try making a tweet saying, blah, 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 fuggin' trans people. How would people feel about that? If I made a tweet where I said fuggin' trans people or fuggin' black people, how would people feel about that? I think that they would be like, what the fuck, Sarah? Like, cancel Sarah yet again. Like, we need to cancel Sarah. But saying fucking Palestinians is apparently okay, and that tweet was retweeted by other people in the industry because it supposedly show, shows support for Palestinians. Like, no, fuck no. I have yet to see a single person who is pro-Palestinian, and I follow a shit ton of them because this issue is very important to me. I follow a shit ton of pro-Palestinian and Palestinian people who, of course, are pro-Palestinians, on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok, everywhere, I follow them. And not one person has ever referred to the Palestinians, even when speaking so passionately as fucking Palestinians or fucking Palestinians. Like, that is a very misplaced word. Like, 
if you support Palestinians, you do not put the word fuggin in front of Palestinians, just like you would not put it in front of black people or trans people. You do not put the word fuggin in front of a group of marginalized people and claim that that is support for that group of people. Like, what the fuck? Like, what the actual fuck? But you have people who retweeted this as being a good thing. There was one response to it that said that it was a misplaced word and that response was ignored, but 100% agree it is absolutely a misplaced word and this person you know has shown not much support for the palestinians but this one tweet got like retweeted as being an amazing tweet and being like so supportive of the palestinian people like what the fuck what the actual fuck like i i these people just infuriate me these people are fucking stupid like if you care about the palestinians I have been saying it since the beginning and I know these people don't want to listen to me, but obviously I'm in the right because if I was in the wrong, they could go on Twitter right now and say all the shit about me that they did in 2021. They could be like, oh, Sarah is so dangerous. She's calling out Zionists. Oh, Sarah is so dangerous. She's telling us to read a book. Oh, Sarah is so dangerous. She's telling us that we need to educate ourselves. No, you fucking do need to educate yourselves. You fucking are stupid. You fucking are uneducated and stupid and have bad takes when it comes to Palestine. Like you really fucking are stupid like I just don't know what else to say so yes go fucking educate yourselves go fucking read books go fucking read articles go fucking follow Palestinian creators and see how you should actually be treating this movement and how you should actually be an ally in this movement like these people care so much about being good allies except for when it comes to Palestinians except for when it comes to Muslims like then it can all go out the fucking window like when it comes to Palestinians or Muslims like we have no right to say what is Islamophobic we have no right to say what is like in uh in you know an, an anti-arab uh racist trope like we have no right to say that like when in 2021 when these people started calling me dangerous because you know i spoke up against burnt island games being you know the owner of burnt island games and kids table board gaming being zionist and then supposedly someone made a threat against helena Keppel, which no one has ever seen a death threat i was labeled dangerous calling a muslim woman dangerous that's an islamophobic trope like muslims are always called fucking dangerous like that is an islamophobic trope and when i said it was islamophobic oh no no it's not because you're muslim we called you dangerous it's because x y and z like okay you know what same thing like call a black person something that is known to be a trope for racism against black people i don't know what that would be right now but try calling a black person by something that is a trope you know, a racist trope for black people and then see how that goes down. Or same for trans people. Like, you know, I guess it's a transphobic trope right now, right? To call trans people pedophiles, to call them groomers, right? Because that's a thing we see that is an issue, you know, people claiming is an issue. Like they, a lot of people say that trans people are groomers, that they are pedophiles, that they are grooming children. Uh, so yeah, imagine saying that to a trans person. Oh, but no, no, we're not calling you a groomer because you're trans. We're just calling you a groomer because X, Y, and Z. Like, okay, whatever. Like, it would not sit well with people in the industry if you say something about a trans person or a black person. But, you know, anything goes when it comes to Muslims or people of Arab descent in this industry. Like, same rules just do not fucking apply to us. So yeah, I'm still, you know... I'm gonna point out the hypocrisy and the bullshit when I see it. Like, I can see that Eric Lang still hasn't said shit. Like, he still hasn't bothered to educate himself about Palestine, though he claimed to be an expert back in October about it and made a whole post a post about it. And he claimed to be an expert about it in 2021. Like, I never received an apology from him for all the shit he said to me, you know, where he did his whataboutisms. Like, you know, he expects apologies when people do wrong, when people get called out for bad things. He was called out and never apologized apologize never apologize for his bad takes i have yet to receive a single apology from anyone in this industry for calling me dangerous for pointing out that there is a zionist publisher and designer in this industry who has an issue with saying palestinian lives matter but has no issue with saying black lives matter so yeah so you know again this industry full of double standards full of hypocrisy full of shills and sellouts and I don't see it changing anytime soon. But huge props to Matteo Menapes. So for anyone watching this, go and buy his game Daybreak because I am just so happy that someone had the courage to stand up and make a statement like that. 
Could it have been stronger? Sure. But you know, at the end of the day, that is a pretty strong statement. And it is the strongest statement I have seen from someone who is a designer or a creator of some kind in, the, in, in this industry. Um, it is the strongest statement I have yet to see in this industry, except for myself, but I'm not going to include myself, obviously, when talking about people making statements. So I have yet to see anyone like very clearly and, you know, boldly state that you know, there is a genocide happening. Like all these people on Twitter, these board gaming people, like who claim to care about Palestinian lives, like Eric Lang or, you know, all these other people who, you know, participated in the fundraiser have yet to actually use the word genocide. Like they have not used the word genocide to describe what is happening to the Palestinians and they have yet to condemn Zionism. They have yet to condemn the root cause of Palestinian suffering and Zionism is a colonial ideology and you can learn that if you join my book club and read this book with me and actually learn a thing or two about how Zionism and the state of Israel is a colonial state. It is a colonial power that kicked a native group of people out of its land and for people who make such a big fucking deal about colonial themes and board games it's kind of like like shocking like I mean I shouldn't be surprised but like hello there is an actual colonialism existing before your very eyes which you guys don't give a fucking shit about like you are more concerned with historical colonialism in board games than actual colonialism and actual genocide happening right now fucking priorities people get your fucking priorities straight like there are hundreds of thousands of people who have been killed in palestine and you care more about colonial themes and board games than you do about these people you are too afraid to condemn zionism you are too afraid to lose that money from your zionist creator friends like you are fucking sellouts and shills and i will continue to call these people fucking sellouts and shills until they speak up against zionist creators and against zionism and condemn zionism and very clearly call for a ceasefire and very clearly indicate that there is a genocide going on that is the bare minimum the absolute bare minimum that anyone can do and i just want to remind people of rodney smith's absolute bullshit statement that he made many many months ago in response to an arab creator and i would love to know what this arab creator thinks right now because he and i got into it on twitter where i was like you should not be praising this bullshit statement from rodney like he was head over heels that rodney made a video dedicated to just him saying hey kareem like oh yeah i'm sorry you're losing followers but like it's such a controversial issue blah 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 it's so complicated like he fucking made a statement about why he will not say palestinian lives matter while he why he would not call for a ceasefire his whole statement is about how it's complicated and he can't possibly understand how Kareem feels. Like it was such a fucking bullshit statement that got praised in this industry. Rodney Smith has yet to call for a fucking ceasefire. Rodney Smith has fucking yet to condemn Zionism or talk about how many hundreds of thousands of Palestinians have been killed. Yet here is this Arab creator who was like starstruck and like just so happy that someone like Rodney Smith made a video directed at him just expressing sorrow for all his lost followers. And I would love to know what this Arab creator and he and I have never ever gotten on. Like he's just hated me since the very beginning and I have my suspicions for why that is. And, you know, it could be either because I'm a Shia Muslim and he is Sunni and from an Arab Sunni state, or it could be that he does not believe a Muslim woman should be, you know, as open and out there as I am. Like there could be any number of reasons, but he has always like hated me since the very beginning, this Arab dude. So I don't know. But like, I would just love to know what he thinks about Rodney's bullshit statement now, because this guy claims, you know, he says he cares a lot about the Palestinian issue. And it's not my place to say he doesn't, you know, he probably does. But he should not be praising like absolute bullshit statements, because then you're setting the bar very low in this industry by praising Rodney Smith's bullshit statement saying it's complicated. You just set the bar so low in this industry. You are basically saying, hey, as Arabs, as Muslims, you know, as the Palestinian, you know, people trying to raise awareness for this Palestinian cause. Yeah, the bar is this low. Like you can just say it's complicated and I'm going to like, you know, be so ecstatic that you said it's complicated and that's why you won't call for a ceasefire. Like this Arab creator set the bar so fucking low 
and people like me have been working really hard to make it so that the bar is set where it is for black people and trans people. Like I want the bar fucking high where it is for black people and trans people because that is what we fucking deserve. That is what Palestinians fucking deserve. Like they are fucking human. Like we're all fucking human and that is what we deserve. Like no one deserves to have the bar this low. Like Palestinians are facing a genocide and we deserve the bar to be this high. Like we deserve the bar for Palestinians to be this high and that Arab creator set it so low and it just was really infuriating. I'm like, you are setting us back in the industry. You are trying to undo all of the work that people like me are trying to do in this industry. Like just absolutely infuriating. And then there's like creators who are Muslim on Instagram who have way more followers than I do, who haven't said shit for Palestine because they don't want to lose, you know, all the games they're receiving for free. And I'm like, yeah, you're fucking sellouts and shills. Like, you know, even Muslims can be fucking sellouts and shills. Like I have no respect for these people whatsoever. Like I respect people who are, you know, standing up for what's right and are not afraid to lose business because they stand up for what's right. That is what having integrity fucking means. It means you are not afraid to lose anything for standing up for what is right. That is what integrity is. And countless people in this industry have zero fucking integrity. People like Eric Lang, people like Rodney Smith, people like Our Family Plays Games, all these people who claim to care about Palestine have zero fucking integrity. Like, when it comes to Palestine. And that's why people like them should not be worshipped in this industry. Again, no one should be worshipped in this industry. So that is my long rant of the week. So, but again, you know, very much in the news, in the board game news, but we still don't see people calling out Zionists in this industry. They're not calling out bad actors in this industry. But, you know, Palestine and board games, there was news about it this this week. Um, so yeah. So I intend, when I'm at Spiel, to wear my watermelon resist pin. I intend to wear you know, multiple things that show my support for Palestine. I am not going to be afraid because, you know, again, I am someone who has always worn my heart on my sleeve. And even when it comes to Palestine, I will be doing that. Like it's a, an important cause and I'm going to continue raising awareness about it, even if, you know, in whatever way I can. Like if you want to see, you know, news as it's happening, things as they are happening, you can follow my Instagram and uh, click on my stories because I post countless stories about Palestine. Like all the day, all the time I'm posting stuff, like reposting stuff in my stories for, you know, like what I've seen. Um, just yesterday I reposted something in my stories which was really absolutely horrific. It was like literally a baby who had been beheaded and they are picking up the baby's head and putting it in the bag with the rest of the baby's body. This is a Palestinian baby who had been beheaded by Israeli bombs, which is has been happening since October 7th. Like since October, Palestinian babies have been getting beheaded by Israel because that's what happens to babies when you, you know, bomb them. They get beheaded because there's, you know, they're, they're not as strong. Their bodies are not as strong as ours. So while a bomb may kill an adult human, it actually beheads babies. Like it beheads babies. Like it's just, there's, it's just horrific. And so I posted this horrific video in my stories actually, because I want people to see what is happening on the ground. I don't post horrific stuff like that all the time, but yesterday it was just really, I just had to because I'm like, I'm sick of people not being aware or just turning a blind eye to the suffering of the Palestinians. So yeah, so that is what's happening every single day. And every single day, Palestinians are being told, you know, they were being told to move here. It'll be safe for you. Move there. It'll be safe for you. And then once they move, they get, you know, have the shit out of, bombed out of them. Like, it's just, that's what's happening. Like, the intent to exterminate all Palestinians has been clear since the beginning. And you can see so much evidence of it now. You just need to open your eyes to the truth and educate yourselves and you will see it. So, yes. So, I guess that's all for this week. So my question of the week is inspired by Mist Wind. I want to know what is your favorite like um, action selection game in which you have discs with certain numbers on them and it can be 
hidden or not hidden and you have to place those discs around on a board uh, in turn order or whatever to determine which action you want to take. So I guess that's just called action selection and um, I suppose if it's hidden it can be even be like an auction kind of mechanic or a bidding kind of mechanic. So I just want to know you know within that category of games which is your favorite? Like out of all the games I've played so far of that mechanic I would say that Mistwind is my favorite now. Like just the tension of like picking a number you know secretly picking numbers and then one by one placing those numbers out uh, face up and then realizing that you might not get what you picked and then you have to kind of figure out what you can do like oh like it was very tense it was a very tight game just really really enjoyed it I really enjoyed having to even the times where I didn't get what I wanted I enjoyed having to improvise and then rethink my strategy based on the numbers that I had on my discs and seeing what's available seeing what I might be able to do like just a really really great game I highly recommend it um yeah Mistwind so let me know what your favorite action selection game is similar to that and until next week bye